this morning in Moira. Uh, I must say we have quite a lot of announcements to go through and I beg your patience for that. On Wednesday evening Bible class continues at 8 o'clock and then morning worship next Sunday will be conducted by the Reverend Ken Robinson. And just a little note to say that for those who receive the Methodist newsletter, that the cost of that publication is now £17 for the year, and anyone willing to obtain copies of the newsletter, uh, if you wish to amend your current arrangements, please speak to uh, Elizabeth this morning. I'd also request for the members of the catering team uh, they're to have a little meeting this morning with Beryl at coffee time, and I'm sure you'll note that. And then there is a special announcement in relation to a new sort of, well, it's an initiative being taken in regard to the outreach. And I'll just read what it says on this little piece of paper this morning so that I don't get anything wrong. And it simply says that we are expanding our ministry in Moira with the launch of Prayer Line. And this will allow those who in our community who don't yet have a connection with our church to get in contact with requests for prayer. And that's done by email. And there's a request that we need someone to coordinate this ministry, which will be primarily uh, redacting and forwarding emails to members of the prayer line team. Now, if there is someone who is able to do this, uh, you'll need a computer, access to the internet, and you'll need to be IT literate. That counts me out. <laughs> You'll need to be able to set aside, <clears throat> it is suggested, something like five minutes or so each day for prayer line tasks. And if there is someone who maybe feels that God may be calling you to this sort of ministry, uh, please speak with John or any member of the Outreach and Evangelism team any time after this morning's service. And there's also a little note, could all the members of the outreach team please remain behind for a meeting after the service and this meeting will follow the catering team meeting. So you're going to have plenty of meetings this morning. Now this newsletter I've mentioned that and I, I think I've mentioned everything else that, on the announcements except to say uh, that there is tea and coffee after the service and everyone is most welcome to remain uh, for that for a little time of fellowship. There's one other announcement. Um, the Seven Towers Male Voice Choir uh, in concert that Saturday the 19th of November and is at 7.30 in our Navy Church. All the proceeds are in aid of Children of the Peak Sanctuary, Alam Batar in Mongolia. The tickets are available and the suggested donation is £10. And if anybody wants any further details, um, you can get in touch with Charlotte Moore. And all I will say at this stage, because if I take, give you the telephone number, I'm sure you'll forget it before the end of the service. Uh, but if you get in touch with Charlotte Moore, um, her phone number is here and available if you want to get that. So 
some words from the psalmist from Psalm 37. <clears throat> Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him, and he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes, for they will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. And so we stand to praise God, singing, if you're using the hymn book, Songs of Fellowship, it's number 307. And the hymn book is Jesus, the name high over all. Yeah. 
And let us pray. Our gracious and our loving Father, it is our duty and our joy to give you thanks and to offer our praise. Yours was the power and the plan which brought the universe into being. Yours is the love which created beauty and order out of confusion and chaos. And it is on you that we depend for our existence and our life. Before all things began, you already were. Your greatness and your majesty are beyond our understanding. You are high and lifted up and at the same time intimately near. You reveal yourself in flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen your glory full of grace and truth. Indeed, in the words of the hymn writer, how great a being, Lord, is I, which all beings keep. Thy knowledge is the only line to sound so vast a deep. But our joy is that no matter how inadequate we feel, we know that you take pleasure in our offering of worship, as it is a genuine and sincere expression of loving and grateful hearts. But when we consider the immeasurable nature of your grace, Lord, we know and realize it's not only truly amazing, but it was because of that grace seen in the death of your Son on the cross that we could be rescued from our sinfulness. And how sinful we are, taking that sacrifice with little thought, giving little uh, thankfulness indeed to the giver, living our lives each day without a real sense of gratitude, and indeed limiting our commitment to the demands of discipleship. Encouraging us toward a greater vision and wider horizons, and we have preferred the safety of the familiar on the routine. We know that there are many shortcomings about which we could be accused. <clears throat> Forgive us for every way in which we have sinned against you. Help us to live as faithful, loving, obedient people for the glory of your Son and the building of your kingdom. And we know what it is to those who openly and willingly <coughs> confess, those who are sorry for their sin, <coughs> that you grant your forgiveness fully and freely, and that the Son that we depend. We also pray this morning for our troubled world and the important issue of world peace. We express our deep concern about the issue of violence in the Far East. Know that a careless word, undiplomatic language, tend to fan the flames of reckless action, resulting in the loss of life. And this morning we pray earnestly for the transformation of such a mindset to the end of reaching a solution resulting in the saving of many lives. We remember too this morning those across our circuit who have medical needs and issues and we pray that your healing touch will be upon them, restoring them to full health. You have blessed us Lord through difficult times in the past. And we know that we can trust you for the future. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing to others by being sensitive to their needs, supporting where possible in any practical way, which for them will be helpful. And we ask all these things in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. We taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we have a hymn for our young people this morning. <clears throat> and if you're using the book, it's number 236, I'm Special. So we stand to say. <laughs> If you but your own, whatever that gift may be, all that we have is yours alone, a trust, O Lord, from you. May we your bounties thus as stewards truly receive, and gladly as you blessest us to thee. Our gifts we bring. Amen. to our scripture reading this morning, which is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we are reading the first uh, 11 verses. So let us hear the word of God. My brothers and sisters, about the times and the dates, we do not need to write to you. For well, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labour pains 
on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers and sisters are not in the darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us. That whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. I want to thank God for his word, and we know that by his spirit he will enable us to see the truth that he brings before us. Amen. Hymn number 205, if you're using the book, I cannot tell who the angels worship. <laughs>
celebration of Christmas. The pressure has already started on the whole cry shopping for Christmas with adverts appearing on TV, other platforms to get out and get bang for the big event. I even have an advert from the BT shop who provides our telephone service. <coughs> It's a period of the year when a lot is spent particularly on things we don't need. It's a period of the year this year with the crisis that we have that it will not be the same. But that cost of living <clears throat> crisis, no doubt, will still mean that there's a lot going to be spent and the purchases that we make really are no way uh, related to the season that we celebrate. But turning to our scripture reading this morning, <clears throat> four weeks away from the beginning of Advent, we're challenged by an equally important event. And that is the second coming of Christ. That second coming when he'll take his church to glory and all those who have redeemed, have been redeemed by a sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary. But for all sorts of reasons, and we could go into them, not for any particular benefit, but for all sorts of reasons, Many fail to take account of the serious nature of Christ's second advent when he will return to judge the world. Here is an interesting statistic. For every prophecy in the Bible about the first coming of Christ, there are eight on Christ's second coming. George Sweeting of the Moody Bible Institute tells a story about how his father felt very deeply about this very important issue. And he recalled him bringing that serious event to the, uh, all of the children. On one occasion after reading a passage from the Bible about Christ's second coming, he gently faced each of his six children with this question. If Jesus returned tonight, 
Would you pray? If Jesus returned tonight, would you pray? And that's a question that every one of us has to answer. And I think that Paul here in Thessalonians 5 has something to say to us about this whole thing. And I want to say three things very briefly. It's very wise and important, first of all, to take account of the unexpected nature of Christ's return. Take account of the unexpected nature of Christ's return. And right at the very opening of this chapter, we can see that the second coming of Christ was exercising the minds of those in the church of Thessalonica. And more than anything, they desired some indication about when this is going to happen. Wanted to know for the best reasons. And the best reason that possibly could be to be properly prepared when he was arriving. Now there would be those who felt that on the approximate date they would have felt that at least it gave them half a chance with their preparation. We would like a student when they know the dates of their exams they devote their time to revision and at that point Time is short and they know they must get down to it. And I want to say this morning, folks, it's the same for all of us in relation to any important event which demands preparation, not least <coughs> that second advent of Christ. Deadline forces us to focus on our priorities and get things sorted. And even though the Thessalonians interested in the date was understandable, Paul reminds them that the ground had been covered before. Verse 1, he says about the times and the dates we don't need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Come at a time when you feel things perhaps are good, when peace and harmony reigns, when you think that your security in every sense can't be breached, you are convinced that you have everything under your control. And when people are feeling that way, that traumatic return will come on them suddenly, as Paul says, as labour pains to a pregnant woman and they will not escape. What a wake-up call. As far as Paul is concerned, setting dates is a pointless exercise. And indeed his grounds for saying that are the words of Jesus himself. For Jesus said in Matthew 24, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. Simple logic. So you must also be ready, he said, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you least expect him. In other words, we're talking this morning about an event that will catch many people unawares. They appointed for the close of human history could possibly dawn like any other day. Normality might be the keynote. The human race will go about its business as it has always done. But for most people, the end will come when they least expect it. Without announcement, like a thief in the night who doesn't give notice of his arrival. 
And when the great event happens, those who have discounted, who have denied, who have disbelieved the gospel of God's redeeming grace in Christ, they will be separated from God for all eternity. Indeed, they will suffer the loss of everything that gives worth to our existence. The C.S. Lewis, who wisely said, precisely because we cannot predict the moment, we must be ready at all moments. And similarly, Hudson Taylor, since Jesus may come any day, it's well to be ready every day. Certain but unexpected nature of Christ's return. Solemn warning. So what's the proper preparation in relation to Christ's return? And what Paul is emphasizing is the fact that we must live each day with an attitude of watchfulness. We need to keep ourselves in proper focus in the anticipation of Christ's arrival. We need to get the word out to the world around us so that no one need experience the outcome of the day of the Lord as it's described in Scripture. Paul underlines two points. To the believer who has trusted Christ for salvation, he's saying, don't rest on your laurels because your future has been taken care of because of your faith in Christ. And he says to the non-committed, don't be fooled because there doesn't seem to be any cause for concern or any sign of storm of accountability. There's no room for apathy, no room for laziness, no room for complacency regarding God's kingdom of light. No place for smugness, no place for couldn't care less attitudes, no resting on our laurels. Paul is exhorting us not to fall into the trap of living in a fantasy world of make-believe. Make sure you have a pressing sense of the reality that Christ is coming again, coming soon, and we have obligations to the world at large to prepare them and to do it in a way which doesn't miss the point. And Paul then goes on to talk about the surpassing grace of God in verses 9 and 10. And what an overwhelming truth we have in these verses. He says two important things. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that verse. God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that we may live together with him. Our ultimate salvation depends on God and what he has done for sinners in his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus fulfilled the will of the Father and paying the price of our redemption so that we might live eternally with him. That hope of salvation is well founded. And it is well founded because it stands firmly on the solid rock of God's sovereign promise and Christ's atoning death. Nothing to do with our own individual goodness. Nothing in relation to our moral performance. Nothing 
linked to compassionate action or anything else which is commendable and good. Our salvation is utterly dependent on the fact of who God is and what God has done through Christ dying on the cross. <coughs> and indeed, if we are trusting in Christ as our Redeemer and Saviour, we will not be amongst those who are victims of wrath. Rather, there will be a place prepared for us by Christ himself to be with him. We may have an appointment with death, no doubt about it, but while we are found in Christ and have accepted by faith his atoning sacrifice for my sin and for your sin, we will not have an encounter with God's holy wrath. And such is the case if we are committed to Christ. In thy place, condemned he stood. In thy place, in your place, condemned he stood. And those who are found in him are bound for glory. He died that we might live. And that's the only preparation which makes sense and underwrites our heavenly inheritance. If Jesus returned today, would we be ready? And the last thing I want to say this morning is this. It's about the hope of those who are awake and live in Christ's light as the scripture places it. Telling us that there's a double barrel benefit for those who have placed their faith and their trust in Christ. It is the here and after dimensions. Benefits for living in this sinful world and blessings in the world to come. Paul says in verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. It's a rich privilege to belong to the family of faith. Throughout the scripture, we find commands and directives for Christians to look out for each other. To look out for each other. Every member of the family of faith has a ministry to each other. And it applies not only to the local church, but also the wider Christian community of whatever denomination or strand. And in these days when pressure is pressed hard in all sorts of circumstances, it isn't hard to find people who are discouraged and anxious. People who are concerned about their health. People who are lonely and down in spirit. People with problems that seem to them insurmountable. You and I know that the world that we live in is a harsh place. It seems to give a rough deal to many people. And the church family is a place where those same people find support, encouragement, and the help to have their heart lifted. And I can tell you from pastoral experience that many people have been both rescued and prevented from spiritual shipwreck because of the interest and practical concern issuing from the church fellowship. There can be a heavy heart in every pew, but I'm assured by the fact that there is also a community of support in the church as well. And when we're in it together and we owe it to each other to share one another's burdens and joy, and I know that it happens. And I must say I find that the lovely part of verse 11 
where Paul says, encourage one another, build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Just in fact as you are doing. What a church commission. What a ministry of encouragement. And it will lift us when we're down. Indeed, it will inspire us perhaps when the road gets rough. It will give impetus to our efforts when our emotional strength is weak and we really just feel like giving up and giving in. Family of faith is one of the great benefits which Almighty God has given us for life living in this world. And it is so because it makes God's love a reality for us amidst the pressures and the problems. So let us take heart from it. Let's cherish it. Let's exercise it. Paul says the greatest blessing will be experienced in the world to come. He says Christ died so that we may live together with him. I can tell you, I find it hard to take that in. He died so that we may live together with him. What grace, indeed at what cost. I can't claim to know what heaven will be like. And really if I were honest I would have to say that the detail is of little consequence. I'm more than satisfied with that promise of living together with him. Surely that in itself is heaven. Especially when you think of the world that we are presently living in with all the brutal cruelty. When you think of Ukraine, when you think of North and South Korea at the minute, and just yesterday I read that Iran is supporting Russia in their fight against Ukraine by supplying drones. All of us know about the world that sin has created. And it could get very much worse. But won't it be great when we are delivered from such an environment? Because in heaven there will be no sin. In heaven the Lord for us will be that we are children of God. A benefit that nothing in the world can equal. That means that we become heirs of all that God bestows upon us. And no good thing will God withhold from those who are his children. No tears in heaven because there will be no sorrow. There will be no pain. Every disease and condition will disappear because God has promised to make all things new. And of course we will meet up with all the saints who have gone on before us. What blessings! And to enjoy them, all that is needed is to make sure that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I hope that it is, because Paul is reminding us Christ is coming back again. coming back again. We are now going to turn to our communion.
will follow the order on the little printed sheet and of course just simply to say that the congregation can join in the different parts of, of the communion. Uh, the bold print uh, gives you opportunity to respond as appropriate. Congregation, if you wouldn't mind standing. <coughs> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all powerful and ever living God, it is indeed right. It is our joy and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You created all things and made us in your own image. When we had fallen into sin, you gave your only Son to be our Saviour. He shared in our human nature and died on the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand in glory, where he lives forever to intercede for us. Through him you have sent your holy and life-giving Spirit and made us your people a royal priesthood, to stand before you to proclaim your glory and celebrate your mighty acts. And so with all the company of heaven we join in the unending hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, let the earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise you, Lord God, King of the universe, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ has risen, Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Therefore, Father, as he has commanded us, we do this in remembrance of him and ask you to accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine may share in the body and blood of Christ. Make us one body with him. Accept us as we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice and bring us with the whole of creation to your heavenly kingdom. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Amen. him, with, with him, him, in him, Amen. in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be given to you, Almighty Father, from all who dwell on earth and in heaven through all ages. Let me see you. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Though we are happy, we are in the body of Christ. God's sharing in the true bread. The blood of the Lord Jesus shed for me. It guarantees and keeps me in eternal life.
come to your table, trusting in your mercy, and not in the goodness of your spirit. We are not afraid that he will gather up the promises of your wisdom, but in his sure nature always of our mercy, and the not of the king. So feed us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your son, that we may forever live in him, and he in us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and those who come to me shall not hunger. Those who believe in me shall never thirst. Draw near with faith. Receive the sacrament to your comfort, and feed on him in your heart and faith with thanksgiving. remembering the cost of your salvation. in peace because God's peace is yours. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us with this sacrament, united us with Christ, and gave us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for those who have placed their faith in your redeeming purpose. Amen. Now let us from this table rise, renewed in body, mind, and soul. Christ, we die and live again, his selfless love has made us whole. Then give us courage, Father God, to choose again the pilgrim way, and help us to accept with joy the challenge of tomorrow's day. On our concluding hymn this morning, if you're using a book, it's number 72. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. <coughs>
unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day forever. Amen. Amen.